Welcome, I'm Pastor Linda, and I am so glad to be worshiping with you today. And welcome to all of our friends at home or online that worship with us. Um, I do want to just let you know, because sometimes sitting in here, you don't realize that who was out there, out there. <laughs> so, um, so I made a line just so you would be understand um, that these are an average of each week for the month of January. So each week we had at the nine o'clock service an average of 56 people online worshiping with us. And at this service, we had an average of 67 each week worshiping with us. So I wanted to let you know that you're having a lot more people. <laughs> And for our friends at home, we are so glad that you are part of our faith, our faith family here, and we appreciate you. So thank you for being with us. So as we all gather together, whether online or in person, we are coming to just glorify God and to celebrate being a community of faith. Amen? And as a community of faith, we have a lot of things going on right now, so I just want to share some of those. I invite you to look in your bulletin and, and just make sure you take a note of the different things that are coming out. We have a lot of things coming up next Sunday, and uh, so take a look at those. One of the biggest things that's coming up next Sunday is so important is what? Super Bowl, okay, the last football game of the season. You gotta get your football in while you can. And so to commemorate that, we are having a contest, not a contest, uh, I wanna see how smart you are, okay? So we have out in the courtyard two boxes, one for the Kansas City Chiefs and one for Philadelphia Eagles. And I want you to bring your canned goods during this week. Um, and next Sunday will be the last day, and ch let's see if you can predict who's going to win, all right? So we're going to check it out on Sunday after all of this is coming in and, and see which, who you've picked to win, and then we'll watch the Super Bowl and see if you're right. So, um, so look through, go to the grocery store and get your, uh, get your items and put them in whoever you think will win. So we'll see. Um, do want to let you know, uh, last Sunday, uh, one of our um, dear teenagers here at the church, Jake Logan, died. Um, it was, so I was not able to announce that last Sunday, and his service was yesterday. Um, so uh, you can, if you know the Logan family, please drop them a note and uh, just share some stories of how much you loved Lo uh, tr uh, Jake, sorry. Um, and as a result, we have a lot of flowers that they have left here, and we have put a lot of them in the F Haley Hall, and we have some here that we're going to add to it. I would invite you on your way home, stop by Haley Hall, and pick out some flowers and just take some home in um, honor of Jake and celebrate him so that they'll be used and appreciated. Um, we also, today after church, is our church picnic, so I hope that you'll come and hang out, and we're going to be under the trees by the picnic table, and just bring your picnic lunch, and uh, we have music that's ready to go, we're going to have our, our great band that's going to be playing, we have cornhole ready, I need to some people to play cornhole with me, and we'll just have a lot of fun, so I hope that you'll, if you don't have your lunch with you, swing by Subway, and if you're going by Subway, Boy, let me know and I'm going to give you my order to pick up, okay? So, uh, but we hope everybody will come and let's just have some fun as a church family. Um, finally, I just want to draw your attention. If you're a snowbird, I know we are so glad that you are here and, and now and I'd like to just have some time with you. And so there is uh, information where I, we're going to go to um, lunch. And so um, the information is in your bulletin. And just let me know if you can go. And uh, I just want to go hang out with you and catch up and see what's been going on since I've talked to you last. So um, that information is in there. I am so glad that we are all together. There's nothing better than coming together and worshiping our God who loves us so much. Amen? 
So I'm gonna invite all of you now as we come together to stand and for you at home to be a part of the invocation that will be on. And let's join together in our invocation. God of love, fountain of prayer, we confess that our silence is noisy, our minds filled with distracting chatter, our thoughts focused on problems, and our eyes bombarded with temptations. How hard we find it to be still and rest in your holy and healing presence, and how hard we make it by driving ourselves to busyness and fatigue. God of love, usher us into your holy presence. Teach us the words to pray and the silences to keep. Refashion our days and hours so we may always live in constant gratitude for your amazing grace. Amen. Please stand for... Affirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. is a powerful and transformative tool that allows us to connect to God and seek his guidance and his presence in our lives. This time in our worship when we pray can bring a sense of peace and grounding that helps us to remember that we're not alone in our struggles and in our challenges. Whether we are facing joy or hardship, let this prayer time help us to find strength comfort, and hope in God's love and care for us. Let us pray. Lord, we take this time to slow down, to be still, and concentrate on you. There is a steering deep down inside of us, alluding to your presence. We will not be swallowed whole by today's worries. We will not be chased into a corner by today's troubles. You meet us here, unencumbered, unimpaired. Your liberation cuts through whatever binds us. In you we find more love than the heart can hold. We pray that we will hear you here amid the sacred silence of this sanctuary. When we cannot see the road ahead and long for hope, draw near. Be with us, hold our fear, overhaul our distress, carry our burdens, mend our hearts. We know the focus of this month of February is love. Help us to endeavor to develop in ourselves the habit of thinking, speaking, and acting from an attitude of love in all our encounters and circumstances. Help us to choose to set aside a harsh word. Help us to not allow our anger to inhibit our compassion or capacity to forgive. Help us to be living and loving to our families, our neighbors, to all we come in contact with. This. We pray to always be aware of your love, which will help us to bring an attitude of love to the whole of our existence. We pray to you, Lord, that the love in our community will expand and flourish. So we thank you, God, for the gift of our relationship with you. Teach us to love as you love. Teach us to hope as you hope. Help us to respect and enjoy the gift of life, the gift of today. Grant us wisdom and courage to use these gifts in your service that following you, we may become instruments of your peace, conveyors of your hope, and builders of your beloved community. All this we pray in the name of your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespass, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Would you pray for me as I pray for you? Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful everywhere. Open our hearts and our minds to receive the particular message that you have for each of us today. And I pray, Lord, that the words I say are not my own, but are yours. Amen. Bless you. <laughs> well, you've been sticking it out. So we are into week four of talking about the book of Revelation. So give yourself a hand. Yay, you've been hanging with it. Good job. It is not the book that most people are dying to talk about and preach about and hear about, but you have stuck with it and I'm proud of you. We've got one more week next week and then, and then we'll put a bow on it. So I'm so glad that all of you have been here. This has been a sermon series that's been a little more preachy teachy than normal, but um, I appreciate all that you've done to hang with it. As we've been looking at this uh, letter, and that's what revelation is, is a lever. And we need to think about that. Sometimes as we think of it as a letter that is being written to Christians who are going through difficult times, facing persecution, unrest, they're the minority, that's not the, they're not the loud voice around them. When we think about that, sometimes this this letter can make a little more sense. It demystifies it in a way because it's people talking and encouraging others. This is a letter of encouragement and a letter of hope for the first Christians and for us. And so we need to hear and ask God to speak to us through this letter because I hear so many people talking now about being discouraged as being a Christian and what's gonna happen and this is a letter to us. So here are these words for you. When we think of it um, as a letter, we think about that somebody cares about us enough to speak to us and that is what's happening. The problem is they're speaking in that weird language, okay? That apocalyptic language that is like very foreign to us. And the first part of the letter we looked at was a little more, more makes sense talking about problems within some ch seven churches. And next week we'll talk, we'll end it up and we'll be looking at uh, what it says about the end and is rapture real or not? And, but then today we have to look at the middle part. And the middle part is a mess, okay? Bottom line, it's where you get all of that apocalyptic mumbo jumbo, the images, and it's just like, ugh. So I'm taking a small part of that middle part and we're gonna to try to look at it to see how you look at it, see if it helps make a little more sense, all right? So that's what we're doing today. So my, it, my word of encouragement with you is keep going, stick with it. So let's do a quick summary of uh, what we're dealing with here. In apocalyptic language and apocalyptic times, one of the things that they are looking at is this sense of good versus evil. And it's very black-white. Good, evil, no gray area, black-white. And it's that sense that there is something happening between the two. And so we, it's that story of persecution. But it's yet that story of hope, of hold on, hold on, an end is in sight. So I want to share some of the characters that we meet in this middle part that gets all muddy and messy. We're introduced to the lamb in chapters four and five. Now, I think the lamb is pretty easy for us to connect to. Um, it is described, the lamb is described as a son of God, slain and yet alive. So who are we talking about with the lamb? Jesus, Jesus yes. 
And then we hear, we get a lot of talk about the dragon. And the dragon is sort of, is a force of evil. You, whatever name you want to put to it, but it is that evil personification. And so then we also have the beast. And the beasts are the communities of faith that have been following um, Nero and Dominicus, but I can never say that right, Dominican, um, that we've talked about. Those were the rulers that persecuted Christians so, so terribly. Those were the communities that followed them. So here we have a little bit of, of who the characters are. But we want to focus today on the 144,000, because this is a, a part of this middle passage that gets very confusing. And people really misunderstand it and misuse it in a lot of ways. So I'm going to read now um, verse, chapter 14, the first five verses. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. So you got it, right? You know what the story's about? You know what it's being talked about, right? I can sit down? Okay, I guess I'll keep going then. Here we have an image of 144,000. And they are followers of the lamb. And who is the lamb? Okay. When we talk about being followers of the lamb, um, that image of uh, a shepherd and the sheep following is very clear. We hear that throughout the New Testament. And it, one of the things that's different from what we understand in this country, when we talk about herds of sheep, how do, how do people keep their sheep in line? When you see them on TV and so forth, what are they, they're using different things, dogs or motorcycles or things to keep them sort of corralled, right? Well, in the Middle East, it was more that they were being herded by voice that the sheep followed the voice of their shepherd. And so that is part of that, that we are following the voice of the shepherd that we know, who is Jesus. So what do we do with this 144,000 number? Some people will tell you that it means literally that only 144,000 people will be saved. That's not very many. That's not very many at all. But that's not really what it's talking about. If you're gonna take it literally, yes, that's what it means. And if you're gonna take it literally, you have to also take it is that the literal translation is 144,000 virgin men that will be saved. Maybe that number, that's more realistic. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, should I? All right, so let's take apart that 144,000. As we know in the book of Revelation, some numbers mean something. So the number 10 in the book of Revelation is sort of like the number seven that means wholeness. 
But the number 10 also goes a little step further that it means also inclusiveness. So it is a whole number that includes all. The next number that we'll see is 12. And 12 represents the people of God. Remember in the early Israelites, there were 12 tribes. And those were the first people of God, were the 12 tribes. Um, so 12 means sort of a total number. Of those 12 tribes, 12,000 um, 12, are attributed to each tribe. And so when you do your math, then you have 12 times 12,000 is 144,000. And it is a picture talking about all the people of God, an inclusive large number of all the people of God. Now you have to think about too, the early church communities were very small. Churches didn't have sanctuaries like this and gather. There may have been five or six people that gathered in homes. And so the number of 144,000 is just a huge, huge number and represents more than they can even imagine. So when we take a look at this, this is talking about not that specifically 120, 144,000 will be saved, but the inclusiveness of all God's people are, will be saved. And then we talk about that whole idea of, of being pure. It's also sort of a preparation that they are getting ready to go to battle. Because soldiers, before they would go to battle, they were told to abstain from any type of sex. That, was to, that would sap their energy that they could take into battle. We have the story of David and Bathsheba and her husband in 2 Samuel, where David was trying to um, make sure that he was defiled before he went into battle. So we see that in other scriptures that happen. So here, this 144,000 are preparing to go to holy war. So it is a reminder for all of us that, that there is a battle that we are a part of because we are part of the total family of God. The 144,000 means all of God's people, is that we are part of that, and we are preparing for battle. And that's what's happening here in this scripture as they're preparing for battle in that apocalyptic style of writing. It is the Lamb's elite battle force that is getting ready. Okay, so what do we do with that? What do we do with that? The message of Revelation, and let me clarify, it is Revelation not with an S on the end. This isn't lots of messages. This is one revelation that Jesus Christ came to save us, came to, to be here for us, forgive us for our sins, defeated death on the cross, gave us the gift of salvation, gave us hope and possibilities and new life. That is the revelation of this gospel. I'm sorry, not this gospel, this book. It is a sense that we need to hold on to no matter what we go through in life, that we hold on to the lamb, to Jesus. 
And it's a reminder for each of us that we are not alone. We're part of not just 144,000, we are part of God's family. We are part of so many. We are never alone. No, never alone. Because we profess our faith in Jesus Christ. We all just said the Apostles' Creed and confessed what we believe in. And all God's people, as they profess their faith in Jesus. So one of the things that we have to remember now, then that this is telling us is that the war has already been won. Jesus won the war. Jesus defeated death on the cross. Jesus died for us, for our sins. The war has been done. But we still have some battles that we have to to play out. We still have the battle of trying to figure out how do we live that? How do we live in a, a time where we struggle with faith, where the noise around us is louder sometimes than our Christian voice? How do we, how do we go out when we're used to being the majority and now maybe we're not? Maybe you're with a group of friends that you used to hang out with that were all Christians and all went to church on Sunday. So you planned your event Sunday afternoon. And now your friends want to get together on Sunday morning. And you say, well, no, I have church. And all the rest of them go, well, it's just a better time to get to the beach in the morning. Come on, you can miss church. The battles that we're to face And the battle that the book of Revelation talks to us about is between truth and lies. Did you hear that in the scripture? The battle is between truth and between lies. This is what we have to figure out. And in a day of social media when we are bombarded by information, How do we figure out what is the truth and what is a lie? The dragon is a system of lies. The dragon represents all those things that that look good and sound good, but are lies. And the lamb are those truths that we hold true, that keep us strong. And that is our struggle, isn't it? To try to figure out what is the truth and what is a lie. So let, let me give you some clues. A lie does not hold up over time. A lie may seem really good at first and it seems like it's got quick answers and everything, but a lie does not last and it leaves you empty. A lie is connected to self and self-needs. Truth fills us, and truth lasts. And truth is not about self. Truth is about the whole. Again, that 144,000, the whole, the kingdom of God. A lie will leave us empty. At some point, maybe not at first, maybe it seems exciting and seems to give us quick answers, but it will leave us empty. Now, we all struggle with truth and lies, don't we? I have to tell you, one of my pet peeves is lying. I don't like lying. I try very hard never to lie. You want to make me mad and get on my bad side? Call me a liar and you, uh, you'll get my dander up, all right? And lies just hang with us. You know, I can remember a time in fourth grade. See, it was a lie that I did that still bugs me today. 
In fourth grade, we each got a chance to take care of the aquarium, the class aquarium. And you would be able to take care of it during that week, feed the fish, and you could get up during any of the work times and just go over to the fish tank and, and take care of it. It was a privilege. So it was my week. I was the fish person. So I went the first day and I went and picked up the food off of the counter to, and opened up the, the ball and went to, pour, to feed it. And instead of the little things sprinkling out, this gush of liquid came out. And I quickly put it back up and I'm like, oh my gosh. And it was, I found out later it was the thing that oxygenates water. When you put it in, when it's not ready, it takes out the uh, whatever to get it ready for the fish. Well, I figured out nobody would really know it. So I went ahead and fed them and sat back down until somebody noticed that the aquarium was starting to bubble and these things were, and, and even worse, that the fish were going belly up. And the teacher asked me, Linda, what did you, did you do something? Did you, no, mm-mm, I just fed them. Are you sure? Mm-hmm, I just fed them. And I went home and I was upset and, and my mom asked me, no, nothing happened. I never told the teacher. I think they figured it out because I think my mom paid for new fish. I think they somehow figured it out. But I never told that teacher. And I wish I could know who my fourth grade teacher was now to go and confess it to her because I have lived with that lie all this time. Lies eat at you. They tear away, they take a lot of energy. And it needs more lies to try to get through the original lie, right? Lies just sort of grow on themselves. And that's the problem. We need that energy for Christ and to follow Christ and then to not live the lies. When we're living the lies, it pulls us away and it drains us. I knew a woman one time that was dying of cancer. And I remember she said this to me. She said, you don't have time to live the lie. You don't have time to live the lie. Well, this passage on 144,000, although it speaks to us, it also gets um, misused and misrepresented. And so let's talk about that just a minute. In the Methodist Church, we do not believe in predestination. And predestination means that, this is a very general, but that um, God has not just picked a certain amount of people to be saved. We believe that God, salvation is open to all. That's that grace. But there are some denominations and some people that believe very strictly in the 144,000 and believe in predestination. And sometimes this passage is something that is used to um, support that. But we believe that Christ has invited all of us, every single one of us, all of us sinners, every one of us, that we are invited to be part of the table, to be part of the, the kingdom of God, that salvation is ours, now, do we believe that we can, as John Wesley used to say, backslide? That we can slide away sometimes from our faith and hold what we hold on to? Yes. Salvation is something that is given to us and we decide how we're gonna use it. And there are some times in our life that we may just be drifting away from God. 
We may feel like we are not worthy of that gift of salvation, and we do everything we can to resist it and push against it. But the message here is of hope, that it is for all of us, all of us. Have you ever felt spiritually dead? Have you ever felt that emptiness or felt that Jesus is so far away from you? Jesus is here to remind all of us. And this is a letter that reminds all of us that we can never go too far, that we are part of the large family. We have God written across our forehead. I know when we talked about the 666 that it was a mark that was placed on slaves to let people know who owned them. But in our passage, it talked about the mark of God on our foreheads, and that is a voluntary that we proclaim that we are a child of the Lamb. Do you ever think about that? that if you, how many of you wear a cross? It's visible. And every time we go out wearing our cross or a, a t-shirt that has something about the church or a cross on it, it's like it talks in our scripture of having the name of God placed on our forehead that people can see and witness to us. I sometimes go, when I go to the grocery store, and it's around a holiday, and somebody will say Merry Christmas to me, and I'm a little surprised, because I'm like, well, they're not supposed to be giving, saying Christmas. But then I'll realize they saw my cross, and they know I'm a Christian, so it's okay to say Merry Christmas instead of Happy Holidays, or Happy Easter. It is important to not listen to the lies, to make sure that the mark of God on us, the name of God is, is loud and clear and is seen and visible by all people. And that's the message of Revelation. We have to fight the lies, hold close to Christ, and that it is not, we are not in it alone, we're all together. I don't know if you heard in the scripture, it talked about the new song, that the 144,000 sing the new song. That new song is like the new covenant that Christ brings to us. It is, it is the new creation that we are part of, that we sing that new song. We give a witness to who we are into the world. Are you living the lie, or is truth shining out where people can see it? I want to end with John 8, 3, 31, 32. Jesus is talking to the disciples and said, If you hold to my teaching, you are my disciples. Then if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for the truth. Thank you for the gift of salvation, of hope, of knowing that we are never alone, that you love us and accept us just as we are. Help us, Lord, to have ears for you and not for the lies that, that continually feed around us. We are yours. Thank you. Amen.
Please be seated. As we share the Lord's Supper today, we remember we need Jesus, amen? And so let us begin by a, a time of silent confession, a time when you look in your heart and you know those things that you struggle with that pull you away the lies of life. And let's confess them silently as we come before the Lord. Dear Lord, hear our prayers. We come before you, Lord, humbled, recognizing how much we need you, and yet how often that we turn our back on you, how often we disappoint you, we fail you. So hear our confession and help us to receive the words that you are forgiven. Through the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Help us to forgive ourselves. Amen. As we gather today to celebrate the Lord's Supper, it is nice to remember that we are all together, and I invite our friends at home, if you have some juice and water and bread or crackers to to please join us as well. We remember that Jesus came into the world to break the bonds of sin for us, to bring that new song, that new covenant, to free us for a new creation. And so as we come forward today, we come with grateful hearts because this is a gift that we could not do for ourselves but need the power of Jesus to break those chains of sin around us. So as we gather today, we remember that Jesus gathered with all his disciples, all who were very different, and I sort of had a feeling there's a few sinful people in there that do, do things wrong every once in a while. And he gathered with them around the table. And at one point he stood up and took ordinary bread from the table. And he lifted it up and gave thanks to God, reminding us to always give thanks. And he said to his disciples, as he says to all of us, this is my body, broken for you. Take, eat, in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup from the table. He lifted it up and gave thanks to God. And he said, this is my blood poured out for forgiveness for the new covenant given to each of us. Take, drink, in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we lift up this bread and this cup to you. Pray your Holy Spirit will fall upon it and all who receive it. That it will be for us the body and blood of Jesus that gift of salvation and forgiveness given to each one of us to help us go forward and sing the new song. Bless this time and all who receive it. Amen. In the United Methodist Church, we serve an open communion table, which means you do not need to be a member of this church or of any church. 
All you need to have is a heart that is open to receiving this gift of grace from God. We will be inviting you to come forward around the table. And I'm gonna ask that as you come forward, you extend your hand. Let's symbolize that we don't do anything to deserve this. Don't take it. Just let the bread be placed in your palm. That symbol of Christ who died for us. And I want you, before you eat it, to just close your hand around it. And a, just a, a moment of thanks and recognizing that you receive and you accept this gift that's being given. We have gluten-free that is available as well. I'm gonna invite Brenda, if you will come forward. And we will have, I'm telling you, um, if you will, if need to be served in your seat, we invite you to stay in your seat. And Tyann will bring the elements to you. If you'll raise your hand so that Tyann can see you. Um, you may have to go like that, all right? That's okay. That's what we need to do for salvation, isn't it? We should all be raising our hands. And so she will bring this, um, this to you as well. The table has been prepared. I invite you to come forward as you will. Just come to the rail and receive this gift of grace.
realize you're saying that. How many of you say, yes, I trust Jesus? How many of you follow Jesus? Did you notice one of the words in the refrain is, I've proved him over and over? We are the witness to Jesus in the world. We're the ones that go and say, this is who Jesus is by how we're living our lives. We are proving him out over and over to the people around us. That is a daunting task. It's just as bad as reading the book of Revelation. Actually, it's, it may be worse, all right? So as you go out this week, are you living the truth or the lies? Which one are you listening to? And what are people seeing in you? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and just be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day and forevermore. And everybody said, Amen. All right.